All right. Uh, hey, uh, thanks for joining once again. Uh, we're getting started with another session of uh, the youth introduction to youth ministry. Uh, we finished uh, page 34 in the previous class. Um, we're talking about the dynamic program and events and uh, talking about leadership and the kind of leadership that this generation is expecting of their leaders. And um, tailoring a youth ministry basically <clears throat> excuse me tailoring a youth ministry that has maximum impact uh, we spoke about uh, impacting millennials and uh, you know um, um you know, how this generation has been has seen how they're so advanced and how they are so very well connected to internet and and, and their perspective of, of life and you know for example uh their online life is perceived uh the same to be the same as the offline uh life as well right and uh we've seen the advancement and the growth of technology and how it's helped uh you know ministries uh, so to say um so relational leadership was the other aspect that we learned and um, so, yeah, we concluded with, uh, you know, dynamic program and events. How do we uh, plan, uh, design uh, strategically an event or program uh, for the youth? Again, okay, having a, a feedback kind of a session, asking important questions, what worked, what did not work well, uh, you know, meeting with your team and discussing uh, to how to better uh, uh, programs, um, you know, in the future. So that is where we stopped at page 34 in your PDF. And um, so we'll continue with page 35. Uh, page 35 in your PDF that talks about depth in spiritual leadership. Um, okay, let me see if I can share the screen. Second guesses. Okay, my apologies. Um, just when I now want to share a thing, it looks like my computer decides to do something else. Okay, anyways, I uh, hope it works. I'm um, right. Um, a class. Please forgive me, uh, but this uh, seems to be a persistent technological uh, problem issue with me being able to share my screen. Sorry about that. I'll see if I can get that sorted um, soon. Okay. Sorry. Can I? Can you just follow along with me in the PDF that I've shared, please? Yeah, I hope that's all right. Okay. Um, so let's continue with page uh, 35. We're talking about a depth in uh, spiritual leadership, uh, spiritual discipleship, sorry, depth in spiritual discipleship. It, talk, it starts off by saying, so millennials may not come with vast knowledge of the Bible, even basic Bible stories have fallen out of their common culture and experience. But this generation is passionate about acquiring new knowledge and it has an unquenchable desire to learn by exploring meaning in depth rather than skimming the surface for superficial understanding uh, right so if this generation is looking for answers and if then if this generation is really good at digging in deep and they are passionate about uh, learning new things uh, we can't be satisfied, uh, you know, but just teaching them the very basics. We need to go deeper as well in our teaching, um, uh, our, our youth. Okay, so provide Bible, Bible teaching and basic doctrine. Um, so it may seem very overly simplistic, but to lead a generation with no biblical background or common knowledge, uh, the church must, uh, must assume just that, that there exists a fundamental need to provide Bible teaching and basic doctrine. Okay, uh, we need to 
teach our younger generation the, uh, is, is so that our youth ministry is not a place of uh, you know get together uh, you know as we've spoken or shared earlier that um, people can get together anywhere right with, uh, you know with their friends and do whatever they want to do what separates us what differentiates us when we come together is that uh, yes it's a time of fellowship it's time of getting to know one another it's time of having fun and building community and whatnot and all of that um, you know is a bonus to be to for a word for the word of god being taught right and um i am forever grateful to my youth leaders uh, and my worship pastor in the 2000s what not who uh, drilled literally the importance of god's word uh, you know into my life and some of uh, some of the young people even today we may get together we talk about uh, how beautiful those days were the, and we talk about the bible studies you know and how it's impacted and shaped um, my life and uh, and in my journey as being uh, a christian and so it's uh, we cannot stress enough on teaching the importance uh, of of bible uh, and its, and its doctrines to our young people right it's like one of the scriptures that we saw uh, i think a couple of classes prior in the book of judges chapter 2 where it says that after one generation passed away there arose another generation that did not know who this god was or what he had done it simply means that the 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 older generation did not take time to invest in their younger generation or to teach them or to share with them about the, all the wonderful things that the lord has done had done and how he brought them out of egypt how he brought how he made way through the red sea how he parted the sea and how he provided for them in the wilderness in the desert how he provided water you know for, through the rock uh you know it was their responsibility to share all of that with the next generation and because they failed to do that uh, the generation that came after who did not know who the lord was or what he had done they walked in wicked ways uh, inviting uh judgment of god okay so uh, it falls on us as leaders not just uh, you know teaching uh, biblical doctrine but also being a shepherd uh, to them right uh, and i think it's uh, in this day and age especially uh, pastors slash leaders can come across uh, very popular uh, you know or is it like um how do i say uh, i'm not sure if it's right to say like a hero worship kind of a thing uh, you know very popular um, and what not you're being a leader in is great and what not but then what we need to have is a heart of a shepherd right we need to shepherd uh, the flock our flock we uh, and and that begins by us learning and realizing that we are a sheep first right? and david realizes that and he writes you know this uh, psalm 23 is known to be a psalm that where david writes in, in during the latter part of his king uh, kingly uh, life but right, but he realizes and says okay although i am a king although i'm king of the nation and although i lead a nation i've come so far and i've been successful in life he still recognizes and realizes that he is a sheep when he says that the lord is my shepherd right so and i think the first step for us being having a shepherd's heart is for us realizing that we are sheep and the lord is our shepherd and he guides us he leads us and and so we we learn from the way he leads us right the way he guides us the way he provides for us the the way he's there for us right as what the shepherd does isn't it he leads us in the paths of righteousness right he provides for us he leads us beside still waters right and we have all that i need uh, some says right so and and as we can draw from those uh from the lessons of psalm 23 uh, we are called to be shepherds uh, to our people uh, to guide them in in the right paths of righteousness right um so that that's the need of the hour as well so we uh, they are not really looking for a star uh, leader but they are looking for a shepherd who will walk with them who will guide them who will walk beside them right so this is a wonderful quote by tom crandall at the bottom of page 35 it says 
if we don't give the next generation an encounter with God, there won't be a generation to carry the kingdom of God. Right? So uh, we owe the world an encounter with God. And I want you to remember that, uh, guys, okay? I'm talking to the leaders, I'm talking to youth leaders, worship leaders, pastors. Um, we owe the world an encounter with the Lord. Amen. Um, I hope you are with me. Um, right, so all of this leads to the next page, uh, 6.4 in page 36. So all of this is great. So how do young people commit to being part of such a community? How do they commit? Uh, what can we do to get them to commit? Right? Um, last month, we did a theme uh, in at APC with the youth meetings on the power of commitment uh, based on uh, one of the APC publications called The Power of Commitment, uh, uh, written by Pastor Ashish. It's a 30 pages, uh, small book, which I would recommend you to read. Um, you know, the, it talks about the importance of commitment, the characters, the characteristics of a committed person, um, right? And I think um, to a certain extent, uh, being committed can be a challenge uh, in this day and age, isn't it? Um, I mean, for the longest time, uh, you know, if you go and ask the people about the meaning of commitment, they would talk about the relationship status on Facebook, you know, committed, yes or no, you know. Uh, but uh, but that, that book talks uh, goes deeper, and I would encourage you to uh, give it a glance when you can. Okay, so how do we, uh, how do young people commit to being part of a community? Okay, the first thing uh, that rests on us as leaders is creating a culture. Okay, now we can talk about culture for a month, uh, the, uh, the importance of culture and how it can be set, et cetera, et cetera. But I just want to give like a gist uh, of, of uh, what we can do, uh, you know, in creating a culture, right? Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a very strong word, like in India, at least, we, you know, we, in different languages, at least in Tamil, we say kalacharam, uh, right? Uh, it's, it, and India is rich, isn't it? And it says, it's, uh, when you ask anybody else, like a foreigner or whatnot, they say, wow, you guys are so rich in culture. The culture of India is so rich, isn't it? Et cetera, et cetera. And that means it's been there. It's been set for years, hundreds of years, decades and decades, uh, right? So how was that going to impact youth ministry, right? So it starts off by saying that the culture that you are creating is the culture that you allow Okay, um, if you do not set the culture of your youth ministry, it will be set for you. If we are not deliberately creating and building kingdom culture, our youth ministry can easily adopt the existing cultures of the society in which we live. Okay, uh, pay attention to that. If we are not deliberately creating and building not just any culture, but kingdom culture, our youth ministry can easily adopt the existing cultures of the society in which we live, now, which may not necessarily always be the healthiest ones. Right? So uh, uh, like, let's take a few negative cultures that can be created. There can be a culture of gossip, a negativity, right? backbiting, complaining, a jealousy. Uh, all of that, if it's not corrected, if you don't set the culture, uh, the worldly culture can can creep into our ministries, right? So it it, it comes down to us in, in in creating and building kingdom cultures, okay? And so a couple of things uh, that we like to emphasize at APC uh, and which we emphasize uh, to my youth leaders as well, as this is the culture that we want to uh, kind of create, we are striving towards, uh, you know, we, we intentionally work towards, Right. First one is come as you are. That's the kind of uh, you know atmosphere and environment we want to create. Come as you are. Is uh, you know regardless of who the person is, what their uh, world view is, what their belief is, 
uh, what their weaknesses are, uh, they are invited, they are welcome just as they are. Right? So with so many options available for young people, it's important that as a youth ministry, we commit to creating a culture where young people can come as they are regardless of what problems they are facing at college or at home and regardless of what they have been through, uh, what, where they've been and what they've done, they can find a place where they are accepted and loved. Right? Uh, we don't label them. Okay. A person walks in with a tattoo and she's like, Oh, you know, that guy is, you know, be, he, we must be very careful not to demonize the person or whoever it is or whatever it is, you know, uh, that you think is wrong, right? Um, but are people, are they allowed to come into your ministry just as they are? You need to ask the question, isn't it? Um, you know, and... And that again is an, uh, an example and inspiration when we see from the ministry of uh, Jesus, the way he did and how, how sinners were attracted towards him. Right? He, he, they came and he didn't shun them away. Right? Uh, and that's why the Pharisees, uh, it made them angry. Right? The scribes of the law is like, who is this man? Why does he eat with sinners? Uh, you know, they asked. Uh, so it's, it's so important that we create a culture where they can come. And it is in ministry that they are empowered. So a sinner comes in, you know, but it is in your ministry, it is in your discipleship that they are empowered to go back and live a different life, right? A, a Christ-centered life. And that's what uh, we ought to do as a ministry, right? So that's one, come as you are. And second is encouragement, right? So in a world where people focus on tearing others down, Let's be a ministry where we are building people up in the midst of a, blue, a bullying and negative peer pressure. Let's create a culture where young people are valued and empowered. Okay, they need to feel valued. They need to know that they are important, right? that they mean something, that their life means something. And so encouragement uh, is a huge part of creating a culture. It's like, an it's like oxygen to another person. But you never know, right? Uh, someday you just wake up and you're really not feeling that great. You feel so mo uh, not motivated and discouraged and whatnot. And someone, a word of encouragement, a nice word uh, of encouragement uh, would be like a breath of fresh air and oxygen to your soul, to your spirit way that helps you get up and face that day and creating an environment of encouragement is crucial in, in, in youth ministry right young people want to be believed in and to be encouraged so as a youth ministry what are we doing to actively encourage young people to be the best that they can be right uh, and the third point is knowing the why now, this is uh, more on the ministry leaders itself. Uh, be intentional with everything that you do in your youth ministry. Okay, more than what you do, uh, it's important to know the why of what we do. Right? Uh, and that can, that can take us to places knowing the why. Uh, it's easy to fall into the trap of doing things for the sake of doing things or because the other church in your city are doing them although that's absolutely fine to be inspired and copy what other ministries are doing, uh, ensure you understand why it's necessary and important for your youth ministry. Right? Uh, it's an important question, isn't it? So, I mean, I can ask you, uh, ask us all this question, uh, you know, for example, why do we go to school so that we can be educated, right? Why do we need to be educated so we can, uh, you know, be literate and, you know, if the popular answer would be to find a job. Why do you need to find a job uh, so that you can, you know, provide for your family, put food on the table? Why do you need to put food on the table uh, so that we can live? Uh, why do you need to live so that I don't have to die? <laughs> so, you know, so the circle can go on, isn't it? And we can kind of... Uh, bring it to our context as in ask, hey, why are you uh, doing this Bible college course? 
And so you will have a response to that, right? And then we can keep asking, okay, why that? Um, you know, so knowing the why uh, is so important, right? Uh, you cannot be here doing this Bible college course simply because you do not find, uh, not know, uh, as in, um, without knowing the why then, and if you're not fully bought into it, uh, then it, it would be a waste of time, isn't it? If you don't really know the why, and uh, I'm sure God can change any situation uh, and whatnot, but uh, just crucial, it's important. So if you know the why of what you're doing, and if you're able to communicate that to your team and, and even the youth, they will see uh, the intention, the motivation behind the activities, the events, the programs that's being done. Okay, so when people know why do you do what you do, they can lean in and own it with even more conviction. Okay, when they know, okay, so this is the vision, this is where pastor wants to go. Uh, now, I believe. This is why I want to be committed to this community. Okay, so knowing the why and communicating that is uh, is crucial as well. And finally, commitment. Uh, as pastors, as youth leaders, you have to be committed first. But you have to be all in 100%. Why? Because the culture can't be created in the absence of trust. Okay, uh, please pay attention to that statement. The culture can't be created in the absence of trust. If you've not bought in, your youth will sense it and they will not buy in. If you don't believe in uh, with all your heart in what you are doing, um, any generation of youth, if there's anything that they are good at, they can smell, uh, you know, if you're genuine or not, if you're authentic or not from miles away. Right? They will sense saying, okay, you know, they're just doing it, uh, you know, um, because they have to do it. And then they will not be all, all in. And they will not believe in your vision because they don't see a vision. Right? And so once that, once as we as leaders are committed full all in, then the youth will see that and then they start to commit as well. Right? So you, your youth needs to be committed as well, both to your group and to grow in their faith. Um, so you need two hands to clap. I mean, you, it's not to say that, you know, we have to do everything. Uh, there's always two sides to a coin, right? Um, it's, it's, it's a relationship. As in, you make all the efforts, right? Uh, we, we, we give 100% in what we do. And then we leave the rest to them, right? They have to ma still make their choice. Uh, and commitment is a choice, right? So both to you uh, so the youth needs to be committed as well both to your group and to grow in their faith right to grow in their faith it requires commitment right if spiritual growth is absent no amount of work on your part to create a vibrant youth ministry will be of any use okay that's where discipleship uh, that's what discipleship is all about isn't it uh, you're committed to grow if you are not committed uh, you know, if you were not committed with this course, you wouldn't have come to the final year. You get, you get what I'm saying, right? I hope you are with me. Okay, so that, that's the importance of commitment. So all of those four points um, it leads us to, uh, is what I believe in building a healthy culture uh, in youth ministry. Now these are, I'm not saying all of this has to be uh, the same four points that you build on for your ministry. But you certainly, if there's anything that uh, makes sense uh, to you guys, uh, can use them or tailor your own points uh, to build, to building a, a culture in your ministry. It's very crucial. Okay, so that's the first part. Uh, the first point was about culture, about how do we make young people being uh, committed to being part of this community. Is first one is uh, setting a culture, creating a culture, and the second point is building a community. Okay, um, building a community. And this is kind of resonating from the previous points and everything that we've discussed. And you see in page um, 38, right? Why is building a community important? What is the difference between a community and a group? 
Okay, that's a question for you guys to ponder on and think on. What is the difference between a community and a group? And uh, if I were to ask you all that question, uh, which I have, uh, you know, all your answers would be interesting, right? And would be right. Um, one of the one of the most popular responses that I get uh, to that question is. A community is very missional, okay? They know what their mission, their goal is. They know what brings them together. A group is, they can just come to get together for a short period of time and, and move on, okay? Um, let's see a few scriptures uh, of what it talks about, you know, the importance of uh, togetherness and unity of two or more people. Romans 12, uh, four to five says, just as our bodies have many parts and each part has a special function, so it is with Christ's body. We are many parts of one body and we belong to each other. We belong to each other. Matthew eighteen twenty says, for where two or three gather together as my followers, I am there among them. Hebrews 10, 24, 25, let us think of, think of ways to motivate one another to acts of love and good works. Let us not neglect our meeting together as people do, but encourage one another, especially now that the day of his return is drawing near. And so many more, uh, you know, we can, um, some of the scriptures as mentioned there, where, where there is no counsel, the people fall. But in the multitude of counselors, there is safety. Right? All of the scriptures to say that, you know, uh, in coming together of godly people, that there is wisdom, that there is healthy counsel, uh, there needs to be encouragement, motivation, motivating one another. Right? And when we gather together in his name, he is there. Jesus is there. Right? That is like... The, that is like the ultimate difference between just a group getting together and a community coming together is we are gathered together in the name of Jesus. That means he is there in our midst, right? And uh, the importance of community uh, can't be stressed enough because we were never created to uh, be alone. We were not designed to be alone. We were created to be relational. And I think the idea of commun community started when God said, it is not good for man to be alone. Right? Um, so just a few uh, pointers on, on the importance of community is uh, our intimacy with Jesus should lead uh, to our involvement with people. Okay, you cannot say that uh, you are a follower of Jesus and you have an intimate relationship with Jesus and say that I don't like people. Right, uh, it doesn't work like that. Right. Um, yes, it is important to have that intimate relationship with Jesus, uh, but it will always leads to, it will always lead. Uh, to, to loving on people, to serving them, uh, right? It's like Peter, you know, on the Mount of Transfiguration, Peter sees uh, Jesus in, a, in all his wonder and, and holiness and his magnificence and in his awesomeness. And Peter says, Lord, can we just pitch our tents and just stay here forever? Uh, you know, the mountaintop experiences are good, right? That's what intimate relationships are like, you know, with Jesus is that mountaintop experience. But ministry is done in the valley. That's where the crowd is. That's where the people are. That's where uh, people, uh, you know, who are hurting, um, who need an encounter with God. So the truth number one is that uh, intimacy with Jesus should lead you to involvement with people. That's truth number one. Why? Because leading to truth number two is intimacy, uh, sorry, love defines us. And we know this popular scripture from 1 Corinthians 13, 1 to 8. It defines us. It literally is, isn't it? 
uh, it just goes on to say that if I could speak all the languages of earth and of angels, but didn't love others, I would be a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. Right? If I had the gift of prophecy and if I understood all of God's secret plans and possessed all knowledge, if I had such faith that I could move mountains but didn't love others, I would be nothing. And from verse 4, we see that love is patient and kind. Love is not jealous and boastful. We, we know the scripture, isn't it? And there I would ask you to, uh, you know, ask yourself uh, to replace the word love with your name on it. And that's when we see that love actually defines us. And that's what is expected of us. Right? Okay, uh, just a simple test. Okay, for, for all you guys. Okay, you can see. Uh, are you, can you all see the PDF? Are you all, uh, do you all have a PDF open? Okay. So, uh, do you see a test, a simple mathematical test there? Okay. So, uh, tell me what you see. Excuse me. Feel free to unmute your mic and uh, share what you see. It's uh, not complicated. It's a very simple mathematical uh, test, isn't it? Addition. Okay. Uh, what else? Addition. All right. A sequence. Sorry? A sequence. I, I, I didn't follow the... Sorry, what is it? A sequence. A sequence, okay. And so what do you see in the sequence? Uh, increasing, gradually increasing sequence. From 4 to 5, 5 to 7, 7 to 9. Okay. Um, so are they all fine, guys? Thomas, Kanan? Aaron, um, well, there's a mistake though. Okay. The third one. Okay. All right. Thanks, Dave. Kiran, Thomas. Um, Pastor, I'm having a little issue to open that file. Checking it, that's why I went right. Okay, Thomas. All right. Prince, what do you see? Kanan. Number is increasing. Number is increasing. Okay. Uh, are they all increasing correctly or whatnot? Kanan, what do you see? Kiran? Okay, I'm not sure they can hear me. All right. All right, so, uh, okay. This is about four plus two is uh, seven. Okay. <laughs> All right. Okay, that's just a fun test. Okay, um, so I normally do this test. Uh, you know, I've done it with, uh, with a lot of young people groups. Um, so the reason I did this is this. Okay, so you have you see four sequences there, right? And the immediate response that I get from a lot of groups is uh, there's uh, there's a there's a mistake. There's one wrong. There's one wrong. You know, the third one is wrong. The third one is wrong. The third one is wrong. Uh, right. <laughs> But uh, not a single group uh, has said the three are right. The, th the three are right. Okay, so why doing this test is just, it, it's almost natural for us to uh, look at the mistakes and be fixated on the mistake instead of seeing the other positive ones. 
right? And similarly, when uh, when an individual comes to church and whatnot, uh, it's very. I think it it can be very easy and natural for us to find the flaws in them and find their mistakes in them. But it takes it takes so much more uh, for us to just dig deep and see the gold in that person. Right. And uh, that's how, uh, you know, uh, godly Christ centered communities are built. Okay. So how can I build a Christ centered community? Uh, there are some scriptures for you guys to just go through and, um, you know, just meditate on and learn on, on how you can build a Christ centered community. I'm not going to go through it all. Okay. So uh, basically in conclusion, uh, you know, a Christ centered community, uh, is built by us just being like a Barnabas or a Jonathan, right? Barnabas is a given name. His birth name uh, that was given to him was Joseph or Joseph. Okay, but the disciples or the apostles gave him the name Barnabas, which means son of encouragement or son of exhortation. Isn't that wonderful that, uh, that your name is given, uh, you know, what we call it as a nickname, right? Uh, it's like, hey, your nickname is encouragement. It's so in line with your character, with your personality, with who you are. And so we're going to call you encouragement, a son of encouragement. Isn't that wonderful? And how wonderful it would it be uh, if, if we are known as individuals uh, who encourage one another, who motivate one another, who build each other. Right? And that is how a Christ-centered community is built. And you know, see Jonathan, who was a best friend of David. Uh, it talks about you know, his life in 1 Samuel 23, 16. Uh, Jonathan went to find David and encouraged him to stay strong in his faith in God. Now, Jonathan's dad, his father, Saul, King Saul, wants to kill David. And David is running uh, away in fear. But Jonathan finds him in danger. He says, like, you know, we need to go out of our way sometimes to find those who are going through a hard time and encourage them. Right? So uh, building a Christ-centered community, building uh, in, in your youth ministry is, is encouragement simply cannot be overlooked. Right? It's so integral to building a culture and building a Christ-centered community. Okay? Uh, hope you guys are with me. Any questions, guys? Okay. All right, so uh, let's move on to uh, the next chapter, chapter seven. This is uh, the last chapter uh, of our course. So how do you keep youth engaged and uh, passionate? Okay, how do we keep them uh, engaged and a passion and uh, I'd like to first ask, start off by asking that question um, what is passion or what is passion uh, the dictionary defines passion as strong and barely controllable emotion a very highly expressive emotion right intense enthusiasm towards or compelling desire for someone or something um, Right? Passion can range from eager interest in or admiration for an idea, proposal, or cause to enthusiastic enjoyment of an interest or activity. So basically, something that you are en enthusiastic about, you uh, you love doing it, is what dictionary defines passion as. But the Latin word for passion uh, means passion, uh, which means to suffer or to endure or to end your right uh, we started off this uh, course by talking about youth ministry as a marathon and not a sprint right for a marathon you need to endure you need that endurance strength to be a marathon runner isn't it and so that's what passion is all about uh, and that's why the last week of jesus's life is known as the passion week right uh, a week of endurance a week of suffering right that, that jesus endured that week Right, uh, and and one of one of the words that I relate to the word uh, passion is fire. 
Okay, uh, why? Simply because fire will not be ignored. Remember, we're talking about how do we, uh, how, how do you keep youth engaged and passionate? How do we keep them engaged and passionate? As always, it starts with us. It starts with me, right? Uh, and so anything when some, uh, anytime when something is on fire, people rush to see it or, or you know, they want to see it. Okay, what's happening there? that's burning you know that that building is on fire and whatnot uh you know it it, it kind of attracts right so we see here you know god uses that symbolism of fire throughout scripture right? moses and the burning bush god's presence as a pillar of fire our god is a consuming fire the tongues of fire as it says in acts chapter 2 right and uh john the baptist um has to stand out all where right? he was the burning one right um, he was burning alone in the desert for god he was so much in passion and in zeal and on fire for god in the wilderness people followed him uh, to hear him speak right his passion for the kingdom of god was contagious right just like the a wildfire that can burn down an entire forest that's how his passion was he was ze he was zealous, uh, you know, uh, in his love for God and and for the kingdom of God, right? And John the Baptist prophesied about Christ when he said, uh, "I baptize you with water of, for repentance, but after me will come one who is more powerful than I, whose sandals I am not fit to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire." Right? And then we see a, se a, a sequence of uh, scriptures where this, uh, this is what happens on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, verse 3 and 4. And so how can you spark a blaze in the lives of your youth so they will lead lives set on fire for God? What can you do? A simple question, a simple answer to that is, they need to see you on fire for God. Okay, they need to see you on fire for God. Uh, I was listening to a sermon last week. Uh, the preacher says, uh, what feeds me feeds them. Okay, whatever is feeding you is what will feed your youth, will feed your congregation, will feed your flock. Right? And if your source of food, uh, everything, that, what you intake about God is, is from God, that's what they are going to get. Right? So uh, the answer to that question is how do we keep them engaged and, and passionate? It is very simple and it starts with us as leaders. They need to see you all out, sold out for God, completely sold out for Him. That, you know, that they will see you burn even in the desert and that they will follow you there because that is contagious, right? So fire is symbolic of anointing, being holy, set apart, pure, right? Our God is a consuming fire, as it says in Hebrew. So, and it is up to us to keep that fire burning, right? Do not put out the Spirit's fire. Let your light shine before men. Uh, that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. Right, so some simple questions. is: Are you on fire for more of God's manifest presence? Is your heart burning for the fire of his holiness? Set yourself ablaze. Are you on fire for evangelism? Are you burning to reach the lost? Do your youth see it in your life? And then we see and we, we help uh, the youth uh, to see the wonder of who this Jesus is and, and the beauty of his holiness. Right? And anytime we see them, uh, anytime they see Jesus for who he really is, um, right, their lives are forever changed. Amen. And Johnson, John Wesley, he says this, uh, when he preached, he set himself on fire and people came to watch him burn. Okay, may that be the way we preach. Right? May that be the way we teach. May that be the way we live.
Right? So if you want to see your teens and youth on fire, it starts with you. Ask God to daily fill you with the Holy Spirit and empower you. Okay. Um, I would uh, encourage you to uh, get your hands on this book called uh, Unquenchable Worshipper. I will upload the PDF uh, in the stream section for you all to uh, go through it. It's a small 120 pages book, uh, which I would encourage you to go through. Okay. Uh, and also mentioned some of the resources uh, that will help you in your journey in youth ministry. Okay, guys. Um, well, so that's uh, the end of this course. Um, but thank you. And I hope uh, you were able to learn uh, you know, something um, that you can take away some wisdom and knowledge uh, from introduction to youth ministry. Okay. Um, thank you for joining. And I'll stop the recording now.